The Deep Dive Podcast is powered by Adler.im and brings you real stories from the Isle of Man's business community. Hosted by the Atla Group, we explore the journeys of entrepreneurs, business leaders, experts, government representatives, and our own team. Hello, humans. Welcome to the Deep Dive Podcast, brought to you by Martin, that's me, and powered by Atla. Today, I'm joined by Jason. Jason, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure. We did a dry run, so we'll be pros at this now, so there's, <laughs> so there's no excuse. Uh, so perhaps to kick off, just perhaps you could give our listeners a bit of background to yourself, and ultimately what brought you to the Isle of Man as well, yeah. and the AI subject, which I think we're going to touch on today here or there. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um, so I won't, the whole history, but you know, I grew up in a little village in, in the southwest of England, um, a fishing village, and uh, fast forward to my first sort of tech job, if you like, was, was working with virtual reality. Um, and doing things like how do you uh, make visual design decisions um, on on data that has economic value to it? So the mini that's on the on the road today, um, we we put that into a virtual cave, virtual reality cave in 1993. I think that's before it was on the road. Um, and, and and I was really learning then how visual environments inform humans to make better decisions. Um, so if we change the door cut has a, a physical effect on the manufacturing costs and the materials you use, but it looks better like that. So this visual kind of correlation and, and how you bring data into that. Um, and then from 1998 to three years ago, um, I, I spent the rest of that, that career in, in the data and AI industry. So um, long before chat GBT, but how do companies use data to make predictions and, and, and use that data to analyze their business and, and use that data for, for, you know, all sorts of good things like improving healthcare in hospitals and, and, you know, clinicians using it to sort of, you know, identify um, illnesses before, before they become too serious and, and, and you know, all that, all that good stuff. So um, in three years ago, my wife, um, and I were living in Singapore for the last 13 years prior to moving to the Isle of Man. Um, so Claire and I went to high school together and have known each other for as long as, you know, as long as we can talk about it, since I was 15 and 17, the two of us. Um, and uh, we, we moved out, we're out, we're out in Singapore um, and I was running the sort of big data and AI companies out there. Um, so companies like Databricks was the last one I was with and they're the number two really to open AI right now. So very now and contemporary and exciting. But, but three years ago, Claire got, rheumatoid arthritis um and um yeah, that's you know she was she 47 so at that time i wish she wouldn't be happy to be telling everyone her age but um you know i thought okay you know th this this work intensity with me running around running asia pacific for these companies is probably something that we want to maybe think about because of claire's situation and, and we decided to sort of retire the best way to describe it but you know, take a take a take a you know look at our lives and see where we want to be and and so we looked around the world to where we wanted to live I and mean, obviously we're from england not obviously but we're from england as i mentioned earlier but um where do we want to live and and Claire suggested the Isle of Man, and I came here. Um, and to be blunt about it, it, fell in love with the people. Just thought the people were just really welcoming and very open. And um, you know, Bex from Chamber invited me out for. I came over on a recce to have a look at the place and see whether we wanted to move here. And um, Bex from Chamber and, and uh, invited me to the Chamber drinks just randomly. I was there that week at the same time, and I met a bunch of people like Lisa Karen and um, Carol Glover and others. And and um, so this is it. This is the place that we're going to you know, spend the rest of our lives. And, and um, so we bought a place in Onken and mm. here we are. D d d been interacting for a few weeks, high intensity guy uh, to, to think you've come here to chill out. My observations, <laughs> that wouldn't be the case. But obviously, I, I'm not with you 24 seven quite yet. So uh, <laughs> but are, are you finding it that, that better, I guess, balance for life and spending time with, the, with Claire? Yeah, we're we're getting getting a bit deeper than AI on this one, but I, I I'm happy to to share with you. So, I I think the term would be neurodiversity now. What the way that my the way that my career has gone and the way my my sort of my thinking patterns are is very intense. You know, um, when you run something like Asia Pacific and you're setting up operations there, you you know you're in a plane in Japan one day, next week you're in China, next week you're in Australia, and you know you just it's just an intensity that suits me. To be to be perfectly honest, um, and the Isle of Man doesn't have that velocity, 
Um, mm. it, it has depth, um, you know, and it has complexity, um, but it doesn't have the velocity. And so, to be honest, it's been quite cleansing, I guess, really, the last three years of just sort of, because I've, I've been pro bono, I'm, I'm on the board with Digital Isle of Man. Um, I did that because my wife wanted me to get out of the house. Uh, she's never said that, but I think that's probably the real reason. Um, but my brain doesn't stop and I'm always looking at, and, and you know, I love complex problems. It sounds a bit strange to say that, but I do. And, and, and I love looking at how, how, how can we make things better? How can we improve things? So the Isle of Man has been up for the last three years has sort of been a place that I've, I've really loved to learn about and understand it as much as I can. And then when AI happened, where does that fit into it? And that's complex, you know, you've got the longest, longest, you know, parliament history on the planet. And with that history, bringing this thing called AI into their conversation. And so, um, in sh I've been busy, but yeah. not working or not making right. money. That's probably the best way to say. You oh, know, okay. I've been busy, and and and, and, I, and, I, and I really enjoyed it, and I've really enjoyed the engagement with the community and meeting people and learning about the island. So, so it served me well. I'm, I'm not bored yet. <laughs> it's good to hear. The on the on the AI section, the again, I guess in the public domain, principally, ChatGPT comes along, and everyone's kind of starting to get awareness. AI goes back a long, long time. Where where have you kind of from your experience? I think it dates back maybe even before you were born. But yeah, well, give us a couple of timelines on when it was really kind of first there, and then your kind of first interaction with it, and make us realise that this isn't a new thing, guys. Yeah. So first real interaction with it was in 1998, personally. But the 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 history of AI um, goes back to why we got computers really um, and and so in 1956 and you know there's a few people that were signed who they were the founders of it but let's not get into that debate but around about that sort of period when you know and, and in, let me talk about my personal experience rather than talking about other people's um, in 1998 what we were doing is data mining um, and we were we were using a, a mining model to guide to identify um, people in the company that could help out with problems. And, and in 1998, how we were kind of promoting AI was really complicated. To explain to you what AI was in 1998 was, I had to explain that British Gas were the first company to use this data mining technology. And what they were doing is they dig holes in the ground and sometimes they find things in the ground that they can't deal with. An example is a thing called a crested newt. And the crested newt is, is an endangered species. And so British Gas used this data mining technology to mine their entire company's data to identify people who may be able to help. And they found that they had the chairman of the Crested Newtus Association working for them. Hey, by, the, by the time I've done this, Martin, in 1998, you're like, I don't think this is for me, really, this AI. I think it's kind of... Sounds quite complicated. Yeah, you have to set the data systems up, and then you have, you know the, the the mining technology has to make sure there's quality. So it's quite, it was quite complex then. Um, but you know what we see in the evolution of AI is, I think really three things. You've got data, you've got access to it, the AI thing, uh, which is interface if you think of it like that, and then you've got compute. So from 1998 till 2024 what's happened is the amount of data has gone through the roof and data is where you train your ai think about data science if i've got all the ingredients i can make the most amazing predictions in my science so the more data you have the more better your prediction can be you know think about any you know, any any like a risk a risk assessment you know or, or gambling if i knew every single piece of information i can make a better prediction that's so that's the data the second thing is um the compute and so Although I've been in the industry from 1998 in data and AI exclusively in that arena, um, in a good sort of 10 years ago, big data was the, the term. And what big data meant is that we can store data at a low cost and compute it on demand. It didn't mean big data. To, 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 to most people, they thought, oh, well, I haven't got big data. No, it's just about low cost compute. And it is, a, it is a way that the cloud vendors were able to process lots of data cheaply on cheap hardware. That was what was really driving it. If you had the thing, term Hadoop, and so I, I, I represented one of those vendors in 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 Asia and built their business out. And so the second thing is that compute. So number one, data. Number two, compute. So data's going up, compute's coming down, and then the third thing is access. So going back to that crested newt story. <laughs> You needed to be pretty smart to be able to use that software. Um, you know, you 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 couldn't just click on it and say, "Tell me if there's anybody who works in the organization." Uh, 
chat GPT style. Tell me if there's anybody in the organization who ever has got anything to do with the Crested Newt and find out that the chairman of the Crested Newt Association works for you. So that simplicity of interface, that sort of natural language, if you like, which is what chat GPT is based on, um, that is the third barrier is access. And that was breached really when um, ChatGPT launched in, in November 2023. That, that whole idea that you can use natural language to be able to access large amounts of data to make amazing predictions, i.e. ChatGPT is talking to me. Mm. Um, it's talking back to me in, in a, maybe a humanistic like way. So I think that the evolution has been amazing in the, the last sort of uh, 26 years that I've been in the industry that it was technically possible to do AI 26 years ago, but it was the data really wasn't sorted out at that point. The compute was just too expensive. It, you know, it, it just would take too much cost to, to, to use it the way we use ChatGPT today because the computational costs were just too expensive. So it's come down and cloud's been a big part of that. And, and now we've just got, you know, we're, we're kind of almost getting used to this kind of chat experience. You know, why do I need to go to websites anymore? I can just chat to things. And so that, that's about access. Um, which is you, you can draw a complete comparison to the mobile phone, right? You can just draw a complete comparison to it. You know, it's accessible, it's low cost. You know, a thousand pounds is not cheap or whatever, you know, the, a, a phone is today, but compared to what you've got in your pocket, the compute and, and the accessibility of it and the interface of it. So I, I, it, it's, it's been around for a while, AI, mm -hmm. um, but it was just complex and too expensive before. Now it's not so complex. It's still doing comp behind the scenes. This is the, I think this is the last point on this one. Behind the scenes, it's still doing complicated things. Really sophisticated engineering behind ChatGPT. But it's just a chat interface. So you don't, you're hidden away from all that complexity yeah. behind the scene. And doing it very quickly. And doing it really, yeah. and, and, you know, and Grok and others that are coming down, you know, they're already, I don't know, I don't know if you've seen Grok, it's no. even far. There's, yeah. there's so many models out there now. ChatGPT isn't the only horse in, in the race, if you like. So I um, assume somewhere else will be a, 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 master, a master one that's dealing with pulling all these different, whether it's ChatGPT, Copilot, et cetera, that that's what you'd have thought. It is these different models that the key is just to create a model that uses everyone else's models. Yeah, and that's what's happening. Mm. So that that is what's happening. So these, um, so I've been doing the responsible AI um, work on the island. So I, I, I've been doing that through digital, through the Activate AI program. I do a, a session called Responsible AI. It's about an hour and a half. And I worked something out to sort of, to explain a perspective in this responsible AI session, which is estimations, right? So if this is wildly wrong, just take, I could be 50% wildly wrong, it's still a big number. Just say $600 billion has been spent in investing in AI technology in the last 18 months. So banks, investment houses have said, this is the future, we want to invest in this. And then I said, right, just take that $600 billion and just to, again, wildly out, but just figuratively speaking, take that $600 billion and then say, how many people would be employed in a year as coders if that, all that money was spent on coders? So, so well, say take a salary, a salary of 50,000 pounds, got 12 million people. All right, so it's just imagine that for a second, what we're doing now, and that's why I say it's moved on, is you've got 12 million keyboards clapping away at the moment, trying to solve this AI what's next problem, because everyone's invested in it. And so, it has moved on and it, it, chat GPT isn't the only large language model. It isn't the only way to deploy a large language model today. And you're already seeing this new term agents. Um, and the agent model says, I'll choose which language model I want to use. If I want to use Claude, I want to use OpenAI, I want to use pick your favorite, um, I'll use them and I'll use the most efficient and cost effective one for what I want to do. And so these kind of frameworks of agents um, is, is simplifying the building of AI for anyone now. And so we've moved from, obviously, you know, it's complex. Now we're saying, okay, I, I don't need to just, it's not just open AI. There's others out there. And maybe open AI is too expensive. Maybe I don't like open AI's philosophy. I don't like the values. You know, they're not an open source. They're, they're, they're a, a proprietary software vendor in that sense. Um, maybe I want to use open source because I believe in that philosophically or from a values point of view. So, so in short, it has moved on and it is continuing to move on. At, you know, if you imagine 12 million people typing keyboards right now as we see it, it's not that isn't factual, um, but it's it's an interesting way to think about it. Right. There's people are going to solve this problem. 
because it's considered a hockey stick and it's getting pretty steep that, that it's it's getting pretty steep and and i don't think we've really seen this a level of global people trying to f solve technological problems like this at this pace yeah. before yeah um yeah okay so we're gonna have a go at the quiz okay so give our listeners maybe a sort of cutthroat view of on some some questions for yourself so we've done a dry run before but for those that are new to this which is everyone listening it's a yes no quiz so you can only answer yes no because we're in the isle of man for those manxies yes sir is a good manx term for saying hello or whatever so yes so the answer is yes it's no sorry i'm lying it's ai for yes apologies uh so yes is ai or nay boy for no so, nay boy yeah so ai nay boy. or nay boy nay boy is the manx bit hey boy uh so yeah so just questions ai yes nay boy no so i've got 10 so the dry run we had off but we've got 10 now so uh you can't split any of them, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, so do you think AI will ever enhance human level general intelligence? AI. Will AI systems ever be able to fully understand and replicate human emotions? Nayboy. You're a bit more of an Nayboy twang. Nayboy. Nayboy. There you go. <laughs> do you believe AI will surpass human creativity in fields of art and all literature? Oh, is there not allowed to say in between here on you? Because... Can you ask the question again? Do you believe AI will surpass human cre creativity in the fields like art and literature? Within certain segments, AI. Will increased reliance on AI diminish human empathy? AI. Should in time AI be allowed to make decisions in critical areas such as healthcare and due criminal justice? Nayboy. Nice. Do you think AI-generated content should be clearly labeled to distinguish it from human-created content? AI. Uh, should there be a global regulatory body to oversee the development and implementation of AI tech and all left to each jurisdiction to decide? Oh, sorry, that's an open-ended question. So let's stick with the first part. Should there be an over overriding regulatory body for the AI tech? Regulatory enforcement Globally, Nayboy, should AI be granted some legal rights and responsibilities as humans? By definition, Nayboy, do you believe that AI can be truly unbiased and free from human prejudices? <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully that gives a bit of insight into your into your thinking process. So so let's we obviously touched quite a bit on AI uh, before the before the quiz and uh, the questions. Maybe just to set the scene a little bit, and we've we've chatted about this before around. Uh, let's go a, a basics uh, one hundred and one on on AI. So I'm your mum, which is obviously a bit weird sat here opposite <laughs> you. Uh, but, All right, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, get to bed. Uh, I have a. To explain it to the, the 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 top layer of how how it not well yeah how it works how it interacts what is it what is it to the to the layman because uh, then I want to dig into how people can look at it to enhance their own experience whether it's yeah. whatever that might be whatever they're doing in their life so let's maybe start with the basics at the most simplistic level and to to to, to, to point one example from a mum I'd just say mum it helps us predict things right. based off information that's been fed yeah if i know that the sun goes down at seven o'clock for the last one week i can predict tomorrow that that's the sun is going to go down at seven o'clock again and so all i've done is i've collected that data and then i said predict it to me so that's what ai does it does it it's the algorithm that takes that data and predicts it for you mm -hmm. okay interesting and then so if then i look at it from a practical let's give a few different scenarios so mom at home how would that enhance a lot? Given a couple of examples of where it might enhance her life, so yeah. So you used it. I used it just because you said about my mum. It's just to make it easy, simple. So look, it's about a prediction. It's not just about prediction. There's other types of AI, um, but what it can do for you is it can predict when the oven needs to be turned off, and it already is. So there's AI in your brakes in your car, mum. So um, what it does, it predicts how off, how tight it should be oscillating when you do the abs and that's based on the speed the car's going 
um, and and you know some algorithm that works out how aggressive or how fast it should oscillate, and that is that is that is AI. So it's making a prediction of how to sleep harder. So let's expand that out because that's yeah. uh, that you may call it narrow AI. It's yeah. it's your brakes aren't going to then tell you to when the sun's going to set. It's got a set parameters that it's a, so maybe talk about those different types of AI. Great. If, if they're categorized, if that's the best way. To yeah. Try. So so my mum now is using chat gpt so now i need to explain to her that's a different type of ai what we had before and we've had it for a long time is exactly as you describe it martin narrow ai or goal oriented AI. i've got a goal can you work out how to achieve that goal and when when you see that goal or that signal coming in can you do it for me automatically that was narrow ai the the shift in and and it, it started again i want to say something here's important about ai is that AI is the area of data science. So a scientist using data to understand something better. That's really where it's where the core of AI, I think, uh, you know, it, the, the, the core of it is a data scientist saying, I want to understand something better so that I can do more of it or prevent it. And then in this is from uh, go back to my mum again now. So I say, well, mum, what happened in, in 2023 was OpenAI launched the new thing called ChatGPT. That had been around for a little while. Um, so um, generative AI, should we call that, Mum? So you've know, got this sort of narrow goal oriented, and you've got this generative AI. And generative AI is 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 working very similar to the way that we work as humans. It's 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 predicting, but it's also generating. So being a bit more creative. And so when we talk to it, we it can give us ideas. That's generating new ideas for us. And and so you've got this. Thing that can this AI that can generate things, and you've got this AI that can just get things that are goal oriented done faster and in a more automated and predictive way. Where well, is it generating that? Is from from the code itself, or is it pulling other resources in to go? Yeah. So, so what the neural network, which is the foundation of of the large language model, um, works very very similar to the way the the, the brain works. Um, it, it's and it's a, a, the deep learning side of that is the neural network at the, a, a, a node level, which is very deep. So what happens in our brains is very similar. So there's a thing called the Bayesian theory. What happens in our brains that happens in generative AI is, is quite, there's, there's, a, there's a correlation. There's not a dense, you know, it's not exact correlation, but um, Bayesian theory works like this. I've got some data, um, I've got some inputs, and I've got prediction. And so the more data I've got, the better prediction I can make. Um, the, the, the better the inputs I've got, the better the prediction I can make. So when we think about generative AI, that, what it's doing is very similar to that. So if you think about the brain, it's like the hippocampus, and you've got these nodes in your brain. Um, can't give you the exact number, but there's not as many as you get in, in the large language models now, but we've got these nodes, and these nodes are layered. And so when you ask ChatGPT a question, it's using those nodes to recall and work out what the correlation is and what it should give you as, as a piece of text or as a piece of video. Um, that that really started um, in, I guess, sort of earnest was 2017 when Google wrote the paper, attention is all you need. So not you don't need to maintain the goal, you need to maintain the attention of the model and then how you can supervise and train those models to learn types of things as opposed to take this data and, and come up with the, the, the goal and the prediction. Um, that, 2017 till you know 2023 when it was launched as OpenAI, what they've done is they've trained the model in a, in in a neural network manner on lots of lots and lots and lots of data. So then from that data processing, it can then make quite predict um, creative predictions. I think that that's that that that's 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 a big shift from traditional AI to the 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 the, the, the neural net. Um, deep learning models that we see today. So, yeah, big shift. And can I ask when you say deep learning, is that the same as machine learning for mm. language purposes? No. no. Okay. no. So, do you no. want to talk a bit about what machine learning is? Yeah. Uh, I'm presuming that's different, Leon. Yeah, I'm, I'm not... Appreciating, yeah, what yeah, you're I'm, saying. I'm yeah, not, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a coder, so yeah. I, I, I won't tell you how to build a machine mm -hmm. learning model. Um, get out of there. Yeah, so, yeah, so... so, so it's probably probably not worth me going into yeah, that. Okay. yeah to be honest martin I, like if we get into it you know I'll, I'll get myself tied up in knots on yeah. the difference between machine learning and deep learning but yeah. there's yeah there, 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 are, there differences. are differences there are differences. People say, yeah okay and i presume that's ultimately an area that continues to develop at pace like every other bit of ai 
yeah. machine learning side of it. Yeah, and again, the you know, so when we think about that, what we're seeing is this mass investment in in AI in general. So machine learning and deep learning are advancing at a significant pace at the research level and at the development level. So yeah, we, we, we'll see a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to practical examples where we talk about your, your, your mom and maybe the, the narrow ones, uh, George. So we then apply just a... A, a, a business and maybe give the example of the, the the local firm that started using that i think it went through one of the initiatives run by the government to to start implementing how can you know I suppose the question for listeners that run a business how can i how can i use this tech in my business yeah. because it's, it's there's so many things i think to do it's then perhaps some live examples of what you've seen and how it's been practically applied in businesses to add value yeah um or correct efficiencies etc so the mattress, I guess. Was yeah, was ma on. mattress man. Um, so, activate AI on, on the island. Um, yesterday, chief minister was with um, um, the mayor of London, and they, and they were talking about activate AI and how the mayor of London is is championing a program called Ethical AI. Um, so, the activate AI program is getting some recognition, um, but more importantly, is that the community uplift has happened. So, uh, we've had approximately a thousand people go online for training we've had about i think it's 465 people have come to the hands-on sessions um so and that was in what, eight weeks okay. so for the isle of man you know thank you for for rising up to the occasion and, and learning with us because it's not something that government is doing it's something that we're doing together this pace of change of ai is is, is something that we've all got to learn collectively on so i've been really impressed with the way the island is is coming forward and learning the community of practice as well just before i touch on mattress man um community of practice is something that um is you know digital Isle of man sponsor the tea and coffee but they don't have nothing to do with the events and what they're talking about there so the the the, the um ai community of practice um is getting sort of 30 to 40 people coming every time so they're you know people are going to come in a community sense to learn what's happening in ai and one of those events, um, uh, one of the early ones, um, I think it might be in Chris Kizik's, one of Chris's that, that he does, uh, a mattress man came along um, and was so inspired. He posted this on LinkedIn. That's how we found out about it. So he posted on LinkedIn and said, just had a great session with the Active AI session. Um, gone back, gone and acquired um, a, 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 an AI bot, uh, but a, a large language based one. So a chat GPT style customer service interface, implemented it onto his website. So when he's not there, he's selling pillows and mattresses with not a chat bot, but a, um, a, you know, they're calling it sort of chat commerce now. So, you know, the days of e-commerce, this idea of chat commerce where I can go onto the Mattress Man's website and you can do that now and, and say, well, you know, I've got a bit of a stiff neck or, you know, here's my problem. And it will start talking to you and making recommendations rather than just, you know, what are you looking for? Yeah. Kind of chat chat interface. It'll have a conversation with you and, and help you find the right solution or mattress or whatever it is you're looking for. Um, so that's a really good example where, you know, we've we're helping or supporting the community to learn what is AI and and how does it work. And then some companies are making choices to say, well, actually, I, I could maybe make some extra revenue for, off using this, or I could improve my internal efficiencies. I could maybe reduce my time it takes for compliance and I, and then I'm, I'm going to go and deploy it and and it's a, I think it's a really good example where we all see and, and the the goal for the government was to say how do we support the community to keep up pace globally um, and the global numbers on the impact of, of AI on efficiencies and revenues there's lots of estimations out there but we one of them says that between 9.9 percent .9 and 16.7 percent increase in gdp globally and it did it by a country so the isle of man government said okay well if 9.9 .9 is the lowest then we should maybe just go slightly above that and say let's let's achieve for a 10 percent increase in gdp and we took the the gdp at that point at 5.3 billion and said okay we could forward forecast that then if we can stimulate good ethical uses and responsible uses of ai in the business community mm -hmm. for things like if you want to you know do it online or if you want to improve your efficiencies internally um then we could see a sort of 10 percent of 530 million pounds worth of of incremental gdp to the island and your your role within finance uh, 
in regard to the digital strategy yeah. and, and how that's been implemented. Talk a bit about that. And obviously, like you say, you came here to quote retire, and clearly that's not quite the case for. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're passionate about this. Yeah, just talk a bit about that journey, and then what, what you in in that role and ultimately that role. You've talked a bit there about it, raising awareness, but it's it's longer term strategy. Yeah, thank you. Also, than raising maybe GDP. Yeah, so, so GDP was something that the digital, you know, Lal, Lal and his team decided that would be, a, you know, a fair KPI. and objective KPI. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's that's a good one. Um, but so it's, it's about a year and a half, something like that. Time flies in the AI world, it kind of maybe, maybe a bit less than that, but about a year and a half. Um, the board had asked me a digital, because of my background in, in data and AI, I said, we've got this in the island plan, we have um, three um forces if you like of growth in the in the pyramid and it's it one of them says data one of them says green and one of them says knowledge and i'm not here to debate the island planet it was just it was documented so this is what we want to we want to these economies we want to grow data green and knowledge and so um lal and phil the chairman of digital and and, and ceo said jason we're doing this data understanding how we can build a data economy or how we enhance our data economy on it because we've already got a data economy on the island but how do we enhance it and they asked me to come in and, and do a review and and then they after that asked me if i would want to join the world they put a, a, an eoi an expressions of interest and i, I applied to go onto the board because I, I like the way they were thinking um because on as i said th there's three things in ai there's data there's compute and there's access and data is critical and so the digital isle of man team have been working on this data stewardship foundation um and they've been working on it for, you know thoroughly they're not doing what some other jurisdictions have done is just create trusts and just you know stick data in there so people can exchange it and trade it and sell it they're doing it at a deeper level um they're investigating how how first of all what is data that's kind of deep and how do you then um how do you how do you look after it how do you steward it um do you put it on your balance sheet as an asset can you do that um, can you um, provide practices of ethical uses of data and can you govern that from a corporate entity point of view um, can you can you can you use data in a um, more environmentally friendly way so let's just pick on that subject and I'll, I'll, keep, I'll go down to the AI piece in a second and come back to it um, if you look at the chat gpt it's easy to say the chat gpt interface um there's like i said there's others out there but if we just talk about chat gpt as, as the as the category um we're seeing massive energy increase in data centers so it's it's in the realms of two to three times the amount that we're seeing on a, a the, the, the estimation i saw the day from from a researcher was that it's for a Google search compared to a chat GPT search, it's something like 10x amount of, of compute. So therefore, you know, that level of additional electricity. So we're seeing global data centers go from maybe 2% of, of, of um, carbon contribution to maybe even as high as 8 or 10%. And, and, and AI is a lot behind that. So, so, so that data proposition is, is complex. Um, and the digital team are thinking, how do we as an island, as a biosphere island, as a whole nation biosphere, how do we, um, how do we want to support or not? How do we want to govern or not? Um, how do we want to create an economy on that or not? And we've got it in our iron plan. So it was, it was, it's been an interesting journey over the last year and a half to working out where we put data on that. And as part of, then all of a sudden, so this is July 23, um, November happened and ChatGPT was launched and, and, the, and the board said, oh, wasn't expecting that. And, and nobody was. Gartner weren't expecting it. You know, the, the, the company that I represented weren't, wasn't expecting it to happen as quickly as it did. You know, we all got a little bit kind of surprised, I guess. Um, and so then uh, the board said, well, what are we going to do about AI? And, and how do we, what's our national AI strategy? Because most countries and jurisdictions have one. Um, and, I, and, and then I, I said, okay, well, that's really important because, you know, do we want to have AI in, in our national strategy or not? Um, we saw what the UK did. Um, you know, the changing guard between Rishi and, 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 and Starmer is, is quite significant around their differences on AI. And yeah, 
probably not worth getting into that, but it's it's you know there, there's some stark differences the way that they they were treating AI, um, the way China is with it, the way America is with it. So it's got it's quite political actually this AI thing. And what is our position as an island? Are we anti it? Are we for it? And that means we have to have debate, and that means we have to have you know good understanding of what we're debating. So digital isle. Um, it's not all of those things aren't that's not their job as an agency that's not that's not their job but you know at that, at that point we said well we need to do something so we started talking to other countries around the world so australia and sweden and and, and singapore and the uk and and saying well you know, what should our position be and we're, we're working through it and that's where that activate ai program mm -hmm. started i said okay well look, the best thing to do is something and something starts with how do we help people remove some of the fear and boundaries and do that through education. You know, we're not a, an education institution, we're, we're a digital agency, but we felt that we needed to sort of put a foot forward and just support that. So the learning platform that um, Sarah Ennett has, has personally handcrafted is quite amazing. Um, and then um, the, 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 the partners that are, are running the training and um, we're, we're at the, the point now where we want to launch what we call the Applied AI Service. And that is businesses that have got an idea like Mattress Man, um, but don't really know how to implement it or don't really know what it is or or maybe quite advanced, but needs some support. Um, that the applied AI service is something that the business on the island can then come to the website for the Digital Isle of Man website. And they can say, I've got this business problem that I would like to try out on with AI. Can I do it in a safe way? Um, and then we'll connect you with a partner. So it's not we'll a signpost. Yeah, we'll signpost. Them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the right word, Martin. It's like we'll signpost them to a partner uh, and they can choose if they want to work with that partner or not. So we've been doing quite rigorous sort of governance around that right now. We've been interviewing the partners, you know, quite thoroughly. I just did another one today. Um, and with we, as part of, so just, that's a long, long answer to your question, but I think it's an important one. As part of our journey, we went to, I took some, um, some of the agency team to Singapore to meet with people that I know there and the government. And we did about 50 meetings in a week. So there was, there was, there was nothing other than pure business going on there. You can trust me on that. <laughs> um, and, you know, when we went back to Singapore after we signed an MOU with them in, in, in January this year, when we went back to Singapore and told them our approach, um, Lawrence Liu, who, who's, he's written the book, you know, AI Nation. Um, so Lawrence um, said to me, he said, actually, where you're starting, we kind of wish we'd started there where you have. We've done something right, which is partner with the business, partner with the community, not sit in central government and build teams. There isn't an AI team. We actually put the headcount out for, you know, a, a head of AI for the island. And we pulled that because we felt it was the wrong thing to do. So we're doing, I think, a Manxy way, you know, it's just sort of community-based. How did um, Singapore do it? Did it very, you know, they put 500 million in, wow. in 2017. Um, they put about 1.4 billion now into the AI, national AI program. Right. Um, um, they obviously within that, they've just got different strategies to lots of different strategies. Yeah, they might be grants. Um, so they, if you're if you live in Singapore now and you're a small business, you get a fifty percent discount on buying AI software. Okay, you know, as a, as a as a kind of like extreme end of the scale, um, they've got their national strategy two point zero right now. They've got over ten thousand trained data scientists, and if I draw parity just on a population level, just do the numbers. So eighty five thousand six million. And if I do the number of, of data scientists they've got, I, I calculated out that we need 112 data scientists, 112 to be on parity, mm. just to be comparable to that number, 6 million people and, and just over 10,000 data scientists. And honestly speaking, we haven't got 112 on the island. So we've got some good people on the island for sure. We've got some really good, strong technical people, but we haven't got enough of them. And I presume there's a global shortage anyway. There is a basically. global shortage, yeah. So that, that represents an opportunity for, you know, to build that, go back to where this long answer started, which is, you know, what do we do around data? Well, data and AI are, are, are one and the same um, in terms of, you know, AI is the use of data. So we do have an opportunity on the island to build out skills. 
And one of my personal motives, this is just sort of my intellectual motive, if you like, and, and one of my personal motives, I've got three children, you know, Henry, George, and, and Lily, and, and Henry's 23 years old. Um, he lives on the island. George is at uni at Manchester, and Lily's in London. She's 28. But I wanted Henry, as a 23-year-old, to live on the island and prosper. And Henry's 23 years old, I've said that a few times now, he's all in AI, <laughs> he's, he, he's all over it. And, and most of the kids are. And so how do we, how do we attract Henry to come to, to stay on the island? Um, and that was one of my, you know, one of my thoughts. So what, what does he want? Well, he wants, he wants to hang out with people like mm -hmm. him. He says, where's the community? Where's the AI community? Where, where does that exist? And there wasn't one. And in Singapore, um, there's massive, AI communities there. The, the big data one is about 15, 16,000 people that, you know, they do all these kind of meetups and they, you know, they hang out together and they yeah. solve complex problems. And, you know, this idea of the applied AI service came from that inspiration, which is get really smart, good, decent people in a room, give them a problem with data and they'll fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's what AI is. That's to me, that's what I think of AI is that, you know, we want to solve a problem. We're going to use data to solve it. It's funny that, that, that collaboration side, because in, in, I, I observe in, let's say, well-established environments that competition is is often the the key to not collaborate with. You know, if it's another firm that's similar to ours, for example, but in in growing business areas uh, or new areas, and crypto is an example of that. Where that community, when it first started, they they just they click, and it's I guess they become a team, even though they might be in competition, they develop in different aspects. They become a team, and there's a lot more collaboration, which just escalates the speed of development and problem solving and ideas yeah i whether because it's new i don't know so, it's, so, it's, it's, so the first open source company that i work for is a company called talent um uh they they, they what they the, what they as a technology what they do is they integrate data in its simplistic form but more sophisticated and i remember um susie who was our um, VP of marketing explaining to me why we don't collect emails when people download our software. So we used to give our software away mm -hmm. for free because it's open source. And we didn't collect, um, we collected emails, sorry, but we didn't, no, we, no, we didn't collect emails at first. I said, Susie, this is, this is crazy. You know, I'm, I'm running Asia and, and I don't know who these people are. And we're getting hundreds of thousands of downloads of our software. And, and, you know, we want to upgrade them to the paid version. This is crazy. Susie, please. And she said, Jason, uh, we've got somewhere in the region of 500,000 developers who commit code to our source code, our open source code. And those developers do it because they believe in our mission of, of democratizing integration, making it easy for everyone. And I said, um, now, when they come and download our software, um, they're not looking to use our software to build a website. They're looking at to integrate data. That means they've got a business problem. And if the open source version solves that, then they don't need us. But they're going to come to us when they want a, the upgraded version. You don't need to worry about that. And for me, that was actually quite alien because I'd come from a, a background of proprietary software, you know, where we built our own software and we, we sold it at a fee and we charged a maintenance fee to keep it going every year. But this open source concept was, was, I knew what it was, but I hadn't worked for a company that does this. And then Databricks is the, the last company, I, software company I work for, and they are the masters of this. So they do the same thing, which is they open source it. So all of a sudden you've got you know, half a million developers that aren't on your payroll, that are contributing code to your product um, that you then license at an enterprise level um, and everyone's winning and they're all competing. It's just kind of co-opetition, I think, is the term we've heard before. But and, and it's just fascinating. So and I, I've, I, I've got a strong belief that the strength of the community on the Isle of Man has that same opportunity to create open source. What In what area? That's up for us to decide. But the community is so strong. We just need to get communities together and solve problems together. Mm. I strongly believe, strongly believe, this isn't a them problem. This is a we problem, whatever the problem is. I don't believe that, you know, government are at fault or, you know, Atler are at fault or Jason's at fault. I said, look, no, well, there's no one at fault here. We just need to work out how we solve it. And when you get communities together, as demonstrated by Talons, that company, um, when I joined them, they were about 500 million. 
it was sold for 3 billion. Databricks, when I joined them, they were about 800 million. They're currently valued at 43 billion. So these commercial models of, of competition, they, they are real, they do work, and they do generate enterprise value. And if we think about Isle of Man PLC. Yeah, you're looking at this. Yeah. We've got the same amazing opportunity to get our heads together and solve these problems mm -hmm. together. And that's not an altruistic kind of BS view. It's real. Mm -hmm. It happens. So, yeah, I, I can get really excited about that, Martin. I think that is, a, a, yeah. a, a, you know, yeah, absolutely. A, and, and when this AI thing can help us, I th I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe shift gears just slightly. Yeah. The, uh, and maybe it's a, a yes, no question. Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Yes. So if you had advice for uh, uh, people or, or, or budding entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs starting on that journey and AI advice to them, other than get into it? Really? It's, it's really no, yeah, no, it's really simple, actually. Um, so think again, it, I can answer it really simply to you, which is it's about the problem. That's the answer. Right? Okay. So what I mean by that is... Um, when you, what AI teaches you is that it's about the problem you're trying to solve and defining that problem really well. And then AI in theory can automate the solution. So for budding entrepreneurs, one of the things that I, I feel that, you know, we've gone a little bit awry on is that we forgot what the problem is and we start building solutions too quickly. We get into solving things, and I'm the worst at this, I've got to say. I, I've, I've failed a few times. I've lost, my wife will tell you, some real lumps of, of cash because I've tried to solve a problem that isn't really well defined yet. Um, so my simple advice is it's about the problem is you, you've got to really stay with the problem and keep trying to understand the problem and keep trying to understand the problem and stay there for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you get into solutioning, um, you you might not have understood the problem, and that's that, and that sounds maybe a bit unusual, but it, it's it's coming from that AI background. So when then now, how do you deploy AI? It's the same thing. There's a lot of research on this. Um, you, you know, there are problems, i.e., tasks that we have to do on our to-do list every day, and some of those problems, some of those tasks are completely replaceable by AI. Like, mm. I can't imagine anymore brainstorming without. A GPT. I just can't. It's just like the thought of me having to come up with 10 ideas to, you know, how to market something without a GPT just sounds like a whole lot of pain now. Just like, hey, GPT, give me 20 ideas and I'll take 10 of them, right? So, so there's certain tasks that I do on a daily basis that I, I, I know. Now, what, if, I, if I reverse engineer all of the problems that I've got, if I was to document all the problems, all the tasks that I have, um, there are certain problems that, that AI is really good at solving. Well, just go and learn those AIs. <laughs> just get the so you become more efficient. And 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 that's so from an entrepreneur, uh, budding entrepreneur perspective, stay with the problem for as, as as long as you can, and really make sure you understand the problem because there's too many solutions out there looking for problems. Mm. Um, and then when you found a problem, keep refining the solving of that problem. Don't get into solutioning because you can get in your own head if you go out yeah. there. Yeah, we've obviously been doing an experiment this week, uh, a daily, and again. A, when I reflect on the the week and the daily catch ups, it's going back to it's easy to kind of get distracted and, and forget about what what the week start or the, the going back to what the, what was the problem? Focus yeah, what's the that. problem? And I think and it's, it's I get myself into a dangerous zone. We talk about the difference between men and women think and how they think about problems, but that you actually need a good diversity for that because um, you know I've seen neuroscience images of this that men's men's go from front to back from the cerebral to the prefrontal cortex. So you're basically decisioning. Hmm. And women's tends to generally give them a problem. They tend to stay left to right a little bit more. And, and again, I get myself into it kind of- no, genetic science thing. shows that, doesn't it? Yeah, it's science, science and neuroscience will show you that. So that's why I think having, you know, men and women trying to solve a problem is really good because, you know, we tend to want to just go do mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I certainly i talk about my self personally yeah. when i see something i just want to fix it mm -hmm. just go, okay let's fix that uh, um and and sometimes you need to stop and you need to kind of think stay with the problem for a little sit with the problem is something that i feel very uncomfortable with <laughs> like no no i just want to solve it my wife claire she will sit with the problem for ages and and and, and really process it and, and like i said so so you know sitting with that problem and having a diverse team so i ran asia so I have Japanese people, I have Australians, you know, I've got, they're, they're two, on, two ends of the spectrum. If you ever read Erin Meyer's 
culture map book, mm. how we how we make decisions and stuff like that. So, you you know, having diversity in your problem identification is also important. Yeah. So yeah, but we can get easily get distracted and we can go off and just sort of try and fix it and the new shiny object over there and jump on that. And you know, I think in in those meetings you, you said you said, uh, you know, what about AI and wellness? And and, yeah. and I was Martin. Yeah stop yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's not what we're doing this yeah, isn't yeah. the problem we're trying to solve yeah. and and so yeah you're right we can we can easily get excited about things and then again shift gears slightly slightly more uh and, and maybe to loop back to a conversation or part of the conversation earlier around uh let's say you're wiring and you uh coming here to retire i'm interested to know and again for people that see you operate and uh, at, at this kind of high level is that is that hardware coded into you from just the way you're brought up or what, what's the, why does that get slightly psychological? I, I asked my mum that? that question right. actually when I moved to the island because I realised that my my pace was a little bit faster than others mm -hmm. and, and I phoned her up and I was up at, up at the, uh, the head on Onken and I said, mum, was, was I like this when I was a kid? Was I a nightmare when I was a kid? Was I, I, think, always, I didn't call you a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> was I always pulling stuff apart and trying to work out how things fix? <laughs> she sort of laughed at me and... and I see, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think it is a little bit, um, I, I, I'd say it is, um, you know, we talk about neurodiversity. I never heard of that term before. And, you know, there's a lot of, I don't have big, I'm not a big fan of social media, but there's you know, sort of ADHD and all the, these sort of terms. And, but neurodiversity is a really good way of thinking about it is that I, my, my thinking is, is I, I can, just see lots of dots join and join them together. I'm really good at connecting things. Um, Not something you've worked on, just then. No, well, yeah. then, I, then I did. Okay. So then I, I realized it was a power, but it, sometimes it got in the way. So, so if we talk about brainstorming versus, say, you know, being the CEO, what people want from a CEO is they want, okay, what we need to do is consider these three options. Let me explain the options to you and then we'll hand that over to you and, and give you the choices. So a, a slight pace that sounds authoritative. For my brain, that is really difficult. So for me to slow down and not tell you what option we should take out three, because I already probably know. <laughs> I've tested it out a hundred times, you know, I've been I've been up since three o'clock this morning. So so but I have to that that doesn't work. That's not what the role is of a CEO, and I've been a CEO a few times. Um, so I had to train myself to slow down and to really think about like today's conversation create some space let martin enter the space and, and don't take over the whole conversation uh, i think when the first one we did we did it a little bit faster it's still quite fast but so i had to train myself to slow down um but then recognizing that that, that pace is a real superpower for me anyway mm. um and when to selectively use that and, and, and in that journey, I did a lot of study on neuroscience. So Dr. Andrew Huberman, you know, hung out with him in Seattle with, you know, Stephen Kotler and, and those guys, you know, the rising of Superman and flow states and Cheek sent me Hal and how that works. And, you know, I spent three years coaching uh, a coaching company that used AI to be able to understand cultural patterns in, across, you know, doing coaching across a thousand people in one go at National Grid as an example, a company called Untapped. So I studied and studied and studied it. And then I got obsessed with things like um, running marathons and, um, you know, doing CrossFit and kind of pushing my human performance. And then uh, how do mushrooms and cordyceps fit in there? And, you know, is there an optimal way of drinking green tea to be able to be high performance for 12 hours a day? And um, what else can I do to improve my mental performance and, and strength? And, and I got fascinated in that world. And, and, and where it ends up being as a summary... Because as the CEO, you can't do all of that quick. You've got to say, what's the summary? Well, the su summary is this, is how does data and humans work together? How does AI and humans, how do they collaborate? And that's where my fascination is at the moment. That's the inloop.studio piece that you know, we've, been, we've been experimenting with, Martin. And, and, and so how do we champion the relationship between humans and AI? And that that's a combination of, a bit of neuroscience and thinking about that, but it's also, you know, there's data and there's logic in the AI and how do we bring those two together into harmony? And I, I, I think that, that that field is yet undefined. No one knows what that field is yet. You know, how do you form teams of highly performant 
humans with highly performant agents to be a highly performant company. That's not clear yet. It's not far away, I assume, though. I, I think we're there, actually. It's not, it's just in, in isolations, in, you know, in certain Small pockets. Or yeah, so like playing chess as an example, you know, AI and humans are already competing at that. So, you know, that's a high, hyper performance as, as, as a stupid example. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a journey. And, and, I, and I, I think to, you know, for high performance, you've, you've, you, You've got to want to study it and you've got to love it. And I absolutely have loved yeah. it all, you know, the, this this interrelationship. And I think AI allows us, they, they just, I'll, I'll, I'll draw a summary here on this. So, so that, that harmonization of humans and AI, but then what the large language models seem to be allowing us to do is raise our um, cognition level. So in these in-loop projects, what happens is that we we capture data so quickly, whereas before it was quite difficult. So we can understand an industry, we can understand the processes in that industry within hours. So um, one of the things that we did with, with the project this week that with you is um, we didn't show you this, but we did a complete business process mapping um, from conversations the agents were, were having, and we automated those diagrams. But we'd never done that before. So oh, what if you can do that and Abhishek just did it and all of a sudden what we've got is process flows from conversations so what does that do well that allows you to understand the business a little bit better because now i've got because i'm a very visual person i've got diagrams that were created from conversations around how you do onboarding how you do compliance and i've got visual diagrams so now my cognitive level of your business in a day has gone up oh Okay. Yeah. 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 Got that. Right. Okay. That's that's fascinating. Mm. That, that is, you know, and, and and I think that's a real opportunity for us as humans to be that higher level of performance because the AI can help us raise our recall, if you like, a recall of complex subjects mm. into a, into a level that can allow us to sort of think. Okay, how can we be creative on that? How can we improve that? What can we do with that? Yeah. Pushing the boundaries. Yeah. Definitely. Great. Thank you. I did want to dig into other things, but appreciate the hour's gone pretty quick. So yeah. uh, thank you for joining us. Appreciate the time. I appreciate uh, it too. And yeah, hopefully catch up soon. Been enjoyable. Thank, thank you. you. Thank awesome. you for listening, everyone.